Hello, everyone. It's great to see you, Mark. Thanks for joining us. Great to see you today. Thanks for uh, having me. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be with you. Thank you very much. Uh, my guest today on Fresh Take for the Greater Washington Partnership is Mark Ein. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction about Mark. I'm not going to read the whole thing because that will take our whole our 45 minutes uh, entirely. But uh, uh, Mark is an investor, an entrepreneur, and a philanthropist who's created, acquired, invested in, and built a series of growth companies across a very diverse set of industries over the course of his 30-year career. He's been involved in the founding or early stages of six companies that have been worth over $1 billion and has led over $1.8 billion of private equity, venture capital, and public company investments. Mark is chairman and CEO of Capital Investment Corp. Most recently in December 2020, which seems like 40 years ago, I'm sure at this point, Mark, uh, uh, he launched Capital Investment Corp. 5, a $345 million public investment vehicle uh, with a mission to invest in and help build an industry-leading public company that will aim to deliver long-term value to shareholders. We'll talk a bit more about that uh, as we get into things. Uh, Mark is also the founder and chief executive officer of Venture House Group and Leland Investment Company, both holding companies that create, invest in, and build growth businesses in a range of industries. Among the current majority-owned companies in the portfolio are Castle Systems, which is based here in the region. Uh, it's the country's leading provider of building and office security systems. Uh, and uh, Mark is the chair of that group. Uh, if I had my fob on, you would see exactly what, what Castle does. Uh, and we'll talk more about that as well. Mark's the founder and owner of MDE Sports, which owns the City Open Tennis Tournament in Washington, DC, one of the five largest tennis events in the US and one of only five major tournaments in the US featuring players for both the ATP and WTA tours competing simultaneously. Mark's got a variety of other interests around the world in tennis. We'll talk a bit about that too. A native of the Washington area, he actively supports many community charitable and cultural organizations. And he's currently on the board of the DC Public Education Fund. For those of you don't, that don't know, the fund has raised 130 million of philanthropic support for the DC public schools. Mark currently serves as chair on the board of the Smithsonian a National Museum of Natural History, the DC College Access Program, and the DC Pol Policy Center. Um, I have no idea how you find time to, to fit all this in, but we're very glad you could find time to talk to us today, Mark. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. I'm such an admirer of what you guys are doing at the Greater Washington Partnership, and all of us are thrilled on a personal level that you're leading the organization. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about my career and my presence in Washington. But I think you know the the um, the coming together on collaboration between the business community and local government officials across the region is transformative. Um, for what you, what's already, we already see the fruits of that in things like Amazon and other things. And, and it's so critical to our future. And so uh, congrats and thanks for all you guys do. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks for your support of, of that and your support of all the other things that uh, that you do. Let's talk for a minute, Mark, about about the journey, um, because you really have have done a lot of different things. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about SPACs here in a bit, but um, uh, maybe just give us a quick, you know, how did how did you become who you are today? Huh. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so I actually grew up in Chevy Chase. Um, Went to Montgomery County Public Schools my whole life. My family moved here from New York. My mom and dad from, from New York at the time, a lot of people moved down to New York in the late 60s, early 70s. And, and I love being in DC. I loved our community. Obviously our region was a very different place back then, but it was a wonderful place. And um, from the very beginning, my dream was always to come back. I actually thought I was gonna buy the house I grew up in and live there, that didn't happen. But um, I just, I was really happy being here. And, I think a couple of things that were, when I look back, that were um, signs in my youth of what I would ultimately want to do. One was, I would say, like, I did, I did well in school, but my strength wasn't being the most diligent student. I didn't love homework. I love playing with my friends and doing other things. And I took an accounting class um, my junior year at BCC. I went to Bethesda Chevy Chase High School. And the, the class was basically like, you will have a business and you write the checks and keep the books. And I remember getting this and going home and working five straight hours and getting through the first half of the class, going to school the next day, coming back afterwards and spending seven hours and finishing the semester in two days. Wow. Because I was just, this is like what I want to do. And I was definitely not like it that when it came to like chemistry and physics and calculus, like I could do fine there, but it was not, it wasn't that kind of passion. And so 
you know, there was that. And then like, I was always even entrepreneurial. I was an officer in my senior class and I actually looked at starting a not-for-profit because I was like, why don't we raise money like everyone else? And I called the IRS myself and I got the, and I got the documents for us to do it. And we actually looked at starting a not-for-profit to collect donations. And throughout my youth, there was a combination of interest in business and then entrepreneurship. The other one, I actually put this in my business school application. It was a bit risky because they said like, tell us a story that's indignant of yourself. But when I grew up in Chevy Chase, I went to Rollingwood Elementary School and the center of our life was our soccer team. And there was a parent who basically organized it. And it was for our community, the thing for all of us. And in sixth grade, he just moved to California and we were left and nothing was going to happen. And I, as a sixth grader, organized the team. Like I got us in a league. I got us a coach. I got us practice fields. I got us uniforms. None of the parents did it. And I did it because I was like, there's a need. I'm going to go fill it. And, you know, it sounds like a small story, but the signs were there that business was going to be my thing. And it was what I gravitated to being an entrepreneur Find, seeing problems and I mean and creating solutions was going to be, uh, you know, uh, sort of the mission of my life. Um, and then uh, the other thing, and it relates to this, is I was really passionate about tennis. I, it was I played on the team, I taught tennis. That was like my thing. And I was a ball kid at the tennis tournament in town. And that was the other highlight. Is I got once we got past soccer, once we got into junior high school, being a ball kid at what was the Evening Star and the DC National Bank tournament was the absolute high to be on the court with Jimmy Connors on national TV. And of course we thought everyone in the stands on TV was watching us pick up the balls. Uh, <laughs> but for me and my friends, it was, it was, there's nothing that can, that matched that, you know, being, and, um, and so when I put all that together, I thought, you know, from very early on, I was like, if I can come back to Washington, do something in business, and be involved in it in a grown-up way, these things that I love as a kid, that's my dream. And so I, I, I ended up going to Penn out of college. I worked on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs in the 80s. I went out to LA and um, worked for a vent, one of the a really great venture capital private equity firm. Then went to business school in Boston. And coming out of there, the firm in LA wanted me to go back. And I love living in LA. I was living on the beach in Malibu and it was idyllic. And the firm was incredible. But I got an offer from Carlisle that at the time was five years old. And this is also indicative of the region, JB, is this was 1992. And again, I still had my dream. I want to get back to DC. I want to build a life. But I'm passionate about business. I'm passionate about private equity and venture cap. That's what I want to do. And there literally were two places I could have done it in 1992. Carlisle, which was an upstart, had made some noise but was small and unknown and Allied Capital was the other firm. And I got interviews in both places, but it was the only two things given my interest that I could have done in DC. Obviously, fast forward today, you can come here out of business school and do a ton of stuff and a ton of firms. Um, but I got the offer of Carlisle and I decided this is it. And I literally thought to myself, I loved LA. There was a lot about the place that I loved, but I thought if I pass this up, I'm never, my dreams now, I'm gonna be out there and I'll never come back. And so I did it and I've never looked back. Carlisle was amazing, had a wonderful journey. We can talk about the kinds of things we do, but that's what got me here um, and got me to, honestly, you say like, I, I do have my, we do a lot, we stay busy, but it's because I don't view, like it's not work, it's what I love and what I'm passionate about. And fortunately that's kind of been some version of the vision since I was a kid. Yeah, that's no, that's great, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, yeah, I know when I was, I wasn't watching Jimmy Connor. I was definitely watching you on the on the court <laughs> from, from my TV lots, in California. Yeah, lots of people were. <laughs> yeah, I know, um, we hear that a lot. Um, yeah. Let's uh, let's talk about one of your more recent investments, Castle, um, and and then we'll talk separately about SPACs and and uh, and your, yeah. you know, what those are, etc. But um, talk a little bit about what Castle does, um, how and then how you came to be connected to it. Uh, and then I'd love to get your thoughts about how it's been responding in this COVID era. Yeah. So, th and this is a good way to fast forward because I spent nine years at Carlisle through nine or seven years through 1999 and left because really what I wanted to do, and this sets the stage for how I got in the castle is what I loved, I loved investing in companies, but I, what I also really loved to do is rolling up my, was roll up my sleeves and help the CEO or the founders build their business. And I found that if you did it enough, even though it wasn't the same company or same industry, the things you learn in one situation are applicable to the other. And if you bring 
and CEO entrepreneurs' passion for what they do narrowly and your broader knowledge and skill set in business building, it's a powerful combination. And so when I left Carlisle, because I wanted to set myself up where I could do that in a smaller number of companies than traditional private equity. Traditional private equity, you have seven, eight or nine portfolio companies. So you can't get deep. You can't spend the time. I want to set myself up to where I'd only have two, three or four things, but I would put a lot of time and a lot of capital into a small number of things. And that was what I set up when I started Venture House in 99, started with outside capital, uh, made a lot of investments so really good. And I would say, JP, part of my story is the DC story because, because when I started in 92, just the opportunities to be here, it wasn't just there weren't firms like Carlisle, there wasn't anything to do. The okay. reason they weren't here, I mean, when I would, Goldman Sachs would come on and talk to me about like working with their brokerage accounts and people came down from Philly. There was no office here. And that's not that long ago, there was no office. But, but when I started Carlisle in the 90s, it was the growth of telecom and wireless and actually in the internet and DC was a hub because that came out of the federal government, right? And so, and the first wave of the internet in the 90s really was the building of the networks. Um, and that's what we did. So the UU Nets, WorldComs, and then the AOLs and, and the next tells that was kind of the thing. And so I fortunately was in the right place at the right time to leave, do that. I left to go do what I said, um, make um, a, deeper investments of time and money in a smaller number of things, did that. And then I said, I want to go even deeper. I really want to find two or three things that I can own all of or most of. I really roll up my sleeves. And I looked for a couple of years, mainly in this region, came really close to a couple things. And then a friend of mine introduced me to Castle. And of course I knew it because it's an iconic company. You know, it's like FedEx or Kleenex. They're synonymous with what the product is. And he said, you know, you should go meet my friend who works for the founder um, and the founder, Gene Sandberg's an amazing guy. And I met a couple people who work for him because he said, Gene's like at the point where he may want to do something and you should meet him. And I came back from my first breakfast. I've never, I'd never done it before. And I've never done it since I said to my assistant and my calendar was like, you said it was these days. And I said, cancel everything for the next month. She's like, what are you talking about? And I said, I'm literally dropping everything to see if we can do this because it's exactly what I want. This is like a really important company with an amazing brand, customer base, employee base that I know that it, there's a whole nother level that we can take it as a catalyst to doing it. And it's local. And this is like, you know, I'll never find this again. I've been around enough. And so I dropped everything. Gene is an amazing guy. He and I hit it off the literally the first meeting in the first 45 minutes. And as the story has been told, he left and told his co-founder, he goes, well, I'm going to, I'm going to sell my company to that guy. And, um, and it's been an amazing ride. That was 2007. Um, and what we inherited was really special, but there was a lot more we could do. Um, and as you said, we're the leading provider in the world of managed security services. We secure buildings. Um, We've added video, so we have an integrated video product, um, and we do it for buildings and tenants. We do it in more places now. We do it for government. We do it for multifamily. Um, and that, the company's headquartered here. About half the company's business is here, um, and it's a wonderful company. And you know what we take the greatest pride in is um, about seven, eight years ago, we really said service is the most important thing we do, and so we hired J.D. Power to measure our service. And um, we are now at an 835 average score. Eight, Ritz Carlton is 800. So for what we do, it's really hard. It's like an airline. We have 2 million people who carry our cards, 4 million visitors every day. But somehow we've been able, somehow the team's built really an amazing organization that's able to provide literally the world-class service. We just got named best places to work. Um, so that was something we strive for, and that's fantastic. And then we've got all kinds of industry recognition for innovation. So it's an incredibly special company. It's here. The fact that it's here is central to my satisfaction and passion for it. And then, as you said, um, we view our mission is to secure, is to keep people and property safe. And that the old notion is it's always been generally from physical threats like bad actors and people trying to do bad things maybe natural disasters, we do water sensors and stuff like that. But after we sort of dusted ourselves off like everyone in COVID, we said, well, here's a new threat to people in office buildings and it's our job 
to advise our clients, both the buildings and the tenants we serve on how do we get through this together. And we really made a whole company commitment to understand the issues, use our existing technology, develop new ones were needed to create what we call castle safe spaces so that when people are ready to come back to work, they'll come back to a place where there's things are touchless. You can uh, schedule people so you don't have big crowds. Um, you can track who's vaccinated, who's had it. I mean, it's a whole comprehensive framework and set of products and services to make the return to work safe. And it's really gratifying um, the response we've gotten, the interest in it. Um, obviously, it's been a really hard time, but I will say that I, I feel really good that when people are ready to get back to work, we with our customers can create an environment that is as safe as it possibly can be. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks for that. And I know the barometer is, uh, which is now getting uh, published everywhere, is a really helpful tool for folks to track what businesses are actually doing uh, with respect to reopening and, and what different cities, regions uh, are doing. And we've, uh, we've talked about that. It's been great to partner with your firm in that, uh, Mark. Um, let's talk a little bit about special purpose acquisition uh, vehicles. Um, you've, you've just funded your fifth. Congratulations uh, on that. Uh, if you want to share any other news with this group, you're, you're, you're yeah. welcome to. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Um, <laughs> but um, obviously, they've been in the news big time, and I think a lot of people don't really understand what they are. So uh, maybe take a moment and just talk about what is one of these things? How do they work? Uh, and then yeah. we can talk about what you're looking to do with this one. Thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, so SPACs are all the rage right now. They're the front page of every business section and, um, and you know, nonstop on business uh, on CNBC and other things. Um, so it's basically at its core, um, it's a public company that has cash that uh, is sponsored by someone like myself who has experience, who then go looks for a company to invest in. Almost 100% of the time, it's a private company. What they get is they get our capital and they get our public listing and they get our help. So that's what they get out of it. And um and yeah, we raised the first one in 2007. Again, I gave the background on what I like to do, which is to, to make a smaller number of bigger investments of time and capital, small and things. So it's a guy at City that I'd worked with at Carlisle called me in 2007 and said, well, these things, they've been around forever, but they were small and kind of not mainstream. And they said, we're really going to emphasize, we think there's something here to do it more bigger scale and more mainstream companies. And you're the perfect guy. Your strategy is perfect because it's, you have two years to find one thing. So you have capital and you have a track record. So people will give you the money to do it because when you raise the money, it's just you and what you've done. And so um, we raised the first one in 2007. There was a mini SPAC boom in 2007, eight, nine, there are actually 90 of them done. Um, for a variety of reasons, the structure made it a lot harder to work well for good companies. It's not worth getting into all the things that were in version 1.0, but a lot of them didn't work, frankly. Um, fortunately, and we started as a growth spec to invest in a growth business. And our board, a lot of names from here were Ted Leonsis, board and advisors, Ted Leonsis, Raul Fernandez, John Kim, Hugh Panera. It was, D, it was the DC tech media telecom mafia. Um, Tom Wheeler, who became head of the FCC, um, just goes on and on the kind of those kind of folks who were involved. Um, but then the financial crisis hit in 2008. So a growth company wasn't the answer. And we actually saw an opportunity to create a new mortgage rate because there was massive dislocation in the mortgage market. All the capital, capital was leaving, none was coming in. Returns on underlying mortgage investments were really high just because you had a supply and demand imbalance for the investments. And we said, if we can stand up a public vehicle, it's going to have an unbelievable opportunity. It was really hard to get that deal done because the other thing I should mention is investors, A, get to approve the deal you do. And even if it's approved, if any investor doesn't like it, they, instead of saying, I'm going to, in, I'm going to roll my stock into the merger, they can say, give me my money back. So you've got to find something that A, people in majority approve. And secondly, that investors don't want their money back. So you, when you find a company, first you sell your tracker to raise it, then you go sell whatever you're gonna do. And that was a hard one, but we got it done. We started like $120 million and we had an amazing team that we had met uh, who was fantastic at investing in mortgages. 
And within two years, it had a $4 billion market cap. We raised $3 billion, three plus billion dollars. Um, it today, still today is the third biggest mortgage rate. Its scope has massively broadened. And it was the second best of the 90 SPACs done in that window. But because most of them didn't work, SPACs kind of went away from 09 to 2013. And so then in 2013, we were the third one back, raised a capital investment too. We invest in a company called Limblad Expeditions. We take people on small ships to places like Arctic, Antarctic, an amazing company in partnership with National Geographic located in DC. There's gonna be a common thread here. Everything's gonna have a DC nexus. Um, and so, and a lot of people, John Fahey had been chairman of National Geographic when they did the deal. And so we brought him on the board. So that's in a fantastic company, done great. Then two years later, we invest in a company called Cision, which is the dominant um, software provider for the PR communications industry. It is the platform everyone uses. Actually, the, one of the origins of that company is a company called Vocus, which was a company based in, I think, Beltville or Hyattsville, DC, DC Nexus, but was a big deal. That was a $2.7 billion acquisition. Um, and then the fourth one is an equipment rental company. We provide equipment for building out um, utility networks, telecom networks, rail. I'd have to stretch to come up with the DC nexus for that. I'm not sure there is one, but, <laughs> but, they, but we're the here. So that was it. Um, and then we just raised in December capital five, as you said, with $345 million. And so the reason these have become, so, you know, it, it was there, the, the numbers are incredible. Like we, as I said, we were the third one in 2013 to raise capital two. I think there's been 60 SPACs raised in January this year. So it's wow. completely different. And there's a lot of reasons for it to some extent. So why would someone go public this way or do this? It's a better way of going public than it. It's not for every company, but for a lot of companies, it's a better way of going public for a couple of key reasons. One, there's an idiosyncratic reason, but when you do, a, a, you do it with us, or SPAC, you actually can show your projections to your new investors and you can share more information than in a traditional IPO process. So especially these days where people need to explain like well, how my business is impacted by COVID, don't value me on last year or even this year, look a year out, a traditional IPO process, you don't really get the information you need to be able to talk to people about your business. Frankly, I've been talking to people forever. Like this is how it's just a, it, your investors should get access to that information. They should be able to ask you about it. And so that's been a big reason for why um, they have become really popular now. And then um, you can get public quicker. So people want to get cap, get public quicker. Um, you can raise more money. You get our sponsorship, which is usually really helpful or our help. We really are involved in the companies. And so there's some real advantages to doing it this way. And JB, I think the thing that's the most interesting in what's happening right now is virtually every company that's not public is thinking about, should I explore this back alternative? And why is that? Obviously, the transactions that are happening are performing really well, so they're being well received. But we're at an inflection point in so many industries coming out of COVID where I think you're going to, first of all, there's industries whose growth has either been catalyzed or created by COVID, work from home and Zoom that we're on, all that, stuff like that. But every industry is impacted. And I think coming out of it, there's going to be real winners and losers. And I've seen this movie before. At the end of the day, the winners will be the ones who have the best company and are best capitalized. If you're the best company, but you're not best capitalized, someone who's maybe not quite as good as you, but goes and gets public and raises a lot of money and you don't, you could be left behind. Um, similarly, if you go public and you're not good, that's not good either. But the best ones are both. And, I, and CEOs and boards are seeing that I want to raise capital. I want to be public so I can be offensive coming out of COVID. And so everyone's interested in this. And because there have been a number of things that have worked well, like ours and a bunch of others, people are like, wow, this is a real path to transform my company that combines the best of being public and private equity, does it quickly at scale. And it's something I'm really interested in. Yeah, well, that's great. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll uh, the, the book just got written on what SPACs are all about. So, uh, so that's great. Thank you, Mark, for that. Let's talk a little bit about some of your philanthropic work and how you spend time on some of the initiatives and back to the DC centricity point. Um, you're chair of the DC uh, public education 
fund. Talk to us a little bit about um, what that fund is, how it works with the school uh, system uh, in DC, and because uh, uh, I don't think it's very well known by a whole lot of folks. Yeah, I thank you for raising it because I, I'm so proud of our work and our board and our team there. And I do think it's like the best kept philanthropic secret in town. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that, but the impact has been amazing. So I, we founded about 10, 11 years ago, I've been chair on oh, pretty much since its founding by Michelle Ray, who came into the school system. And, you know, she was obviously a, an iconic person who had a real vision for transformation. And a lot of the things she wanted to do, she couldn't fund through the budget. And because she had a national profile, big national foundations were telling her, I want to give you money and support what you're doing but I don't want it just to go into the city budget. Like I want to know it's going to go to this. And she didn't have an organization or a vehicle to take their money where people could feel like it was accountable, they would be accountable and measured and everything else. And so she's, and there, this model had existed elsewhere. Um, not a lot, but in a few places. And so she created the fund, the way I always think about it, it's a joint venture of the philanthropic community and the school system. So we intersect, we operate at the intersection. We find the things, the most in fact impactful projects that the school system wants to pursue that they can't fund through the budget that private philanthropy is also interested in. And there's an abundance of those things. So we started with the, the iconic and now famous teach, different way of compensating teachers, which was Michelle's big thing is like, we're gonna make you accountable, but teachers are some of the most underpaid people in America and I wanna fix that. I want you to make a lot of money, but you also gotta be accountable. And so we raised $80 million from Broad and Walton and I, I can't even, um, Arnold um, and Tiger, I think were the four, if I get that right, to go fund that teacher kind. We actually, the supplemental pay that was part of that pay system came through private donors through us. Subsequent, it then got built into the model, but we got it going. Another thing that is not as well known is part of that deal is what well, we have to measure teachers and that there was no measurement tool. Uh, and so we created something called impact, which is now sort of the national tool for measuring teachers because we took it and offered it to everyone. The development of impact was funded also through the DC public education fund. And so on the backs, and then the last thing Michelle did, because she came to me and said, here's my vision for all this. And I should give a shout out to Catherine Bradley at City Bridge, because before I got involved, she was kind of, I always call her this angel investor in this. She took Michelle's idea and gave her money to kind of uh, incubate it. And she's been a supporter throughout. Um, but the third pillar of it, what Michelle said, and the last thing is we need to celebrate our teachers. And I want to host the Academy of Award of the Teachers at the Kennedy Center, the Kennedy Center Honors of Teachers. And it has to be at the Kennedy Center. We're going to make it a big show. And so that we call that standing ovation. I have to say that was the part I was like, eh. like I've always thought teachers are underpaid and deserve more recognition. I, 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 I heard her and I thought it'd be good. I, I think I underestimated how powerful that's been. Literally a night in the opera house at the Kennedy Center. We've now moved it to the Anthem, but a packed crowd where we're literally giving an award to the best teachers in DC and telling their stories. And so that's sort of the kernel of it. Over the years, as you said, it's actually up to $150 million. We get support on our big stuff from like Clark and Bloomberg and Porticus. Uh, we get uh, support. We got amazing support this year from Booz Allen and National Geographic and T-Mobile, EverFi. It's, you know, it's Gates and, um, and Catherine continue. I mean, I, I'm going to leave too many people out. People go to the website, but it's just gotten so much support. And we continue to find these amazing programs um, like empowering young men of color uh, program. We, we did a thing where we actually helped, we provided stipends so that seniors in high school could travel overseas because so many people don't get to do that. Um, cornerstones, which is like a core part of the curriculum now um, are all things that we've funded and created. And um, it's, I'm really proud of the work we've done. I think the other thing is, is we have amazing local support, but then we also, have gotten support from around the country because people think the capital of our country should have the best education system. And, and with the support of a series of mayors from Tony Williams, Adrian Fenty, to Mayor Gray, now to Mayor Bowser, this has always been a, a huge priority and we've made huge progress. I think we've been a nice piece of that, but there's so much more for us all to do.
Yeah, uh, that's great. That's a good segue, Mark, to the whole question of the innovation ecosystem for the region generally. You alluded a little bit to this um, earlier when you were talking about, you know, the early 90s when you were looking to come back and there was kind of a dearth of, of ways to do that. Um, and, you know, certainly I recall the, in Colorado, you know, back in the 90s, we were a two horse town, you know, uh, and, uh, and things changed. What, um, what's still missing? Here, if you think about, you know, having this region be identified globally as a top innovation uh, ecosystem, what do you think is still missing? It's such a good question. And I've thought about this so much. So again, going back to what we said, DC really was after Silicon Valley. I can argue, people in Boston would argue in New York. I'd argue it was the second most important technology hub for the building of the networks in the '90s because it all ran through here. And the strength of this region really was engineering. And that's why Northern Virginia exploded. Because it was not a, it was not a set of companies or employees or workforce that like wanted to be in an urban area. It was like suburban engineers working on networks, and we were the center of it. And then we had a couple iconic companies, U Network became part of WorldCom. And the biggest was AOL, which is kind of like the sun that spawned all these other things. And every great entrepreneurial ecosystem needs them because. You get people who have success, they make money, then they become seed investors. And you can look at the, you know, the obviously Ted and Steve, but you can go Don Davis, and then, but then you can go to Jim Bancroft at Box, and it goes on and on and on. And they either start their own companies, they have credibility, so they raise money, or maybe they're seeing themselves. But every, every great entrepreneurial ecosystem has these sort of suns that spawn off, you know, other planets. And, uh, and we had that AOL. I'll tell you another one that doesn't get nearly enough attention. It's amazing is MicroStrategy, Mike Saylor's company, because he always recruited great people. They were really smart, but it's totally underappreciated that Alarm.com, um, Clara Bridge, um, I, there's another one. Like There's like four or five like multi-billion dollar companies that came from people who had been at MicroStrategy. But this is another example. But then after the 90s, the next wave of the internet really was about the creative class. It was about the apps and the social networks you put on. That just was not a strength of ours. And you know, there's companies out and living social for a moment was the great hope that would be the next one. But we never really created that next hub. And by the way, we have it in biotech too. Um, you know, there's human genome science and, and others here who've done a little bit the same, but we never got that next uh, company here. And I remember the discussions with many of the same people that are the founders of your organization, like how do we solve this? And I, to be honest, JD, always said, I, I, I'm really pessimistic that we're gonna create this from the bottom up. And I always thought our strength would be, well, we gotta go get a company to move here because we're good in corporate relocation. There's a lot of good reasons to be here. And that's gonna be the answer. That's gonna, like if you try to do it the bottoms up way, it'll, it may never happen. If it does, it's going to take too long. But if we can collectively put our effort, and I truly said this over and over again, every chance, so like that's the way we can do it. And no one could have guessed that Amazon would look to do what they're doing. But A, to start, the fact that they looked at 218 cities across America, did the most comprehensive by far corporate relocation search in American history and picked our region says a lot about what we have. So that was amazing. But now they're going to be here. It's, it's, and you guys are so central and your founders um, and board are so central to making that happen. That's the game changer for us. You know, we're sitting here in COVID, maybe we've lost sight. It's, you know, obviously they showed their new building that's fantastic. And there's, there's noise, but right now we're all focused on this. But when we lift our heads up in a few years and that's really picked up, you're going to have this, um, the, you know, this sort of center of gravity around the ecosystem that's going to do what I just said and is the thing, frankly, that I think has been missing. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, look, I first found out about the partnership when I was trying to compete for Amazon HQ2 back in Colorado, and uh, um, and uh, we we didn't win. Uh, so I think I, I think to your point uh, that that is a that is a great proof point. Let's talk a little bit about inclusion and and in diversity and equity. Obviously, this last year, you know, every company has um, correctly d understood how central that has to be the mission. The region generally um, is a more equitable and inclusive economy than a lot of economies around the country. Um, and yet it strikes me that that you know, we don't talk about ourselves that way. And we don't necessarily focus on kind of 
inclusion as the new innovation, you know, as the, the distinguishing aspect of this region uh, that, that may be the thing that, you know, attracts that next HQ2 or other. How, how do you think about that as, a, as an opportunity or an issue for the region, Mark? Well, I think it's an imperative for every company, any organ, every organization across the world. I mean, across the country and the world, we're living in a time where this is um, a long overdue, inevitable imperative. I mean, it's, you know, and you shouldn't have a choice. Like, why wouldn't you just want the best people regardless of, you know, gender, race or religion or whatever, it just doesn't make sense. Why not tap into uh, the opportunities for everyone? And, and don't we all want to live in a place where everyone has the same opportunity? And I, I think a lot about, we didn't go back to my family's background. I, mean, I'm a, I am a first generation American and my dad's family came here right before World War II. And my mom's right after, after being in a concentration camp and came here penniless. And, you know, look at the opportunity I've had in America and everyone should have that opportunity, whether you come as an immigrant or whether you grow up in a poor neighborhood, we all should have the same uh, opportunity. And so, it's long overdue. It's great. It's now an irreversible, inevitable trend. And we all, and people are embracing it. And I would say, JD, that one of the things that I, that I didn't know when I was a kid and wanted to come back here, but I came to appreciate as I built my life here as an adult is that the th one of the things about this community I love is that um, in the business community, it isn't really all about just making money. Like people feel like being civically engaged, supporting good charitable organizations, doing good things for your community, taking a multi-stakeholder approach to all your companies is the culture here. And it's not the case everywhere, but it's embedded in it. Look at, again, look at the time and money your organization has been able to catalyze the amount of CEOs who spend huge amounts of time doing what they do to work with you. And, you know, obviously it's central to my life, but I feel like this is a community where it's it's not just accepted, it's expected. And um, and that makes it for a really special place. And it's been like that from the beginning. And it's and it's it's really a core value, I think, of our community, and it's fantastic. And you you know, you do you you have to have patience and impatience when you think about these issues because to really solve these problems is gonna take a long time, but you also need a sense of urgency. And so uh, you know, we really focused on this in all of our companies, um, uh, doing what we can, you know, doing everything we can to make sure that we're providing equal opportunity for every single person. But we're, you know, that's the, the, just, that's just the way it is here and across the country around the world. And that's the way it should be. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, thanks for that. Well, uh, Mark, I was thinking back on your comments about Amazon HQ2 and the, the new headquarters building. I was on a, a call earlier today with a bunch of the CEOs, all of whom now have Helix Envy. They're, they're, all, they're all looking at that new building and saying, well, I'm going to have to put a headquarters with trees uh, up on it. Um, it's an impressive, uh, impressive facade. Yes. I mean, I, I've always, I started my life in the real estate group at Goldman. And one of the reasons I loved it is because you know, buildings, buildings are important for a sense of place and a community. And when you do special things like that, it, it doesn't just impact the people who go there every day, it impacts everyone. And I think I give them massive credit for doing it. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. Um, I know we've just got a couple more minutes. Uh, and again, thanks for all your time this morning, uh, Mark. I know how busy you are, but let's talk just a little bit about tennis. Um, what, uh, how has the tennis world responded this last year and how do things look for it this this year and and the reason i asked the latter is i think you know every industry is kind of trying to understand where are we on this uh, this pandemic journey yeah so um yeah so i've seen my you know the, one of my great passions now is i bought the city open that tennis tournament that i was a ball kid for which was an amazing moment when that came together and frankly it was probably going to leave dc for a whole variety of reasons um and i would thought there is no way I'm gonna let this happen. There's just no possible way. And it had been owned by the WTF and they wanted to do everything in their power to also make sure it stayed while doing their fiduciary duty. And we found a way for that to come together. And so our first year that we ran, it was 2019. And I think people came and saw, wow, this is a whole nother experience with amazing food and entertainment. It was an amazing, and we sold out almost every day. Last year with COVID, we were scheduled to be the first tournament back. We did a lot of work. The city was fantastic. The mayor, John Falchicchio, and helping us do it. 
And in the end, what actually stopped us was not that we couldn't throw it because of COVID. We wouldn't have been able to have fans. It was actually the international travel. So the hard thing about tennis is we move week to week and it's an international sport. And we just couldn't get the people here in time. They ended up fixing it for the US Open that came right after us, but we just, we just, we just missed the timing, but we were ready to go. Um, on a recreational level, tennis has thrived in the pandemic because it's the ultimate social distancing sport. You're far apart. So tennis courts everywhere have been packed over the last years and sports doing well. Um, major events have found a way to be, to be, to, 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 to go. Um, tennis hurts a little bit more in the economic model because we rely more relatively on tickets and sponsors who want to be there in person than TV revenues. So it's a little bit hard to make it work economically, but like, again, for me, the city open, this, that's, I call that a civic investment. That is not, a, a, it's not designed to make money. It's designed to do something amazing that it did for my life and a lot of people's. And so we're committed to doing it this summer in August. Uh, we would have had the best field we've ever had last year. I think we will again. Um, I hope we'll be able to have fans. I doubt we'll have, a, I don't think we'll have a hundred percent of the stands full, but if, we can have 25 or 50% of the fans stands full with the people who've been coming to this for decades. Um, I'd be really happy. We, the people, this, that tournament, like it did for me, means so much to so many people. And I feel a responsibility doing everything we can uh, to make sure that we do that this August. That's great. Well, we'll look forward to it and uh, hopefully we'll all be vaccinated. One, one, one last quick question for you that came from, uh, from the group and is near and dear to my heart, uh, local media. Uh, yeah. Local news media, in particular, you, you look at the, the 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 devastation of the local news media over the last uh, 15 years or so across the country, and that kind of that you can argue correlates with the rise of disinformation, uh, etc. And I know you made an investment uh, locally uh, recently. Is that a category of uh, of interest for you? And you know, any thoughts generally about the whole news desert? Um, problem, if you will. Gosh, yeah. So yeah, so I saved the city, the city paper is going to go under and that's been around 40 years. You know, it's the iconic local alternative newspaper. People don't realize that Jake Tapper started there. Um, that's great. Kara Swisher, we had three McCarthy, Ta-Nehisi Coates was a journalist there. Kate Berlin, it's an amazing training ground for journalists everywhere. Like it's just been amazing. And it was another one like the city open. I was like, well, our community needs this. Um, it is a really hard business model. Um, I call that in my tennis stuff, my biggest accidental not-for-profits because they're definitely not for profit, even though they're not intended to be, but that's okay. It's another civic investment and it's a worthy endeavor. Um, and the team there has done really great through COVID. Um, I, I'm really grateful for all they've done. And, and actually we've gotten it, all we, I want there is it to be self-sustainable, which I think is important long-term. And we were actually very close pre-COVID COVID has been really hard. I'm hopeful we get back. People have been supported. But the bigger thing is that local news is so important. And there's actually amazing studies that show that the amount of high quality local news impacts things like fiscal budgets locally, bond ratings locally, because they just hold people accountable. If you have people there walking the halls of City Hall, people are going to more likely do the right thing than if there is no one. And so it's really critical from a local governance point of view. It also adds to the quality of life and the arts and food coverage that we and others provide. And, um, and we need to really figure out how to make sure. And I just think journalism, when I did it, I was so troubled by the attacks on journalists who I actually thought were kind of saving our world when I did this in 2017 and 18. I thought if you imagine the world closure, I was imagine a lack of a free press, it was really frightening. And again, just come back from where my parents came from, from Europe, where for a whole bunch of reasons, bad forces took over. One is you take over the press. And so um, it's a really important cause and local is, and you know, frankly, national is now doing well. Local is the next thing that we all need to focus on and make sure continues to thrive and survive because it makes a big difference. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, I'll, I'm, I'll follow up on that with you separately, Mark. We created this initiative in Colorado called the Colorado Media Project and launched a digital um, initiative that's gone really well called the Colorado Sun just to try to help solve for that uh, for, for a region. Yeah. yeah, and I think we're making some progress because, boy, I agree with you. I mean, that is just a, that is a, a critical uh, aspect of ensuring that we have a continued democracy. There's just no question. Um, yeah, and, I'm, and again, the team at City Paper, I mean, we really, 
We make sure we do enough features where reporters can go and dig in on issues. But then even just through this, just the, the putting sunlight on the important, on the stuff that you want to make sure doesn't go wrong. And also the things that are going right and the people in our community are doing good things and the great restaurants and arts and all that is really important. And they've done a great job and, and people have supported us through this. And um, so, yeah, we, we all need to make this uh, priority. Yeah, they're empathy enhancers. And uh, so everyone should subscribe. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mark, I think that's easy. Just go to the website. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. It's easy enough. Everyone yeah. can pitch in. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, Mark, look, um, we're at the end of the time that we asked uh, from you. I wanted to thank you very much for uh, participating in this fresh take. Uh, this is a, a super conversation and uh, really valuable. Thanks for all that you're doing uh, and great good luck. Uh, good luck with Castle and uh, the, the new SPAC uh, and all the rest of the work. But uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts uh, today and thanks for, for all that you're doing, Mark. Thanks for having me and, and truly thank you personally and your team and the Greater Washington Partnership for the amazing transformative work you guys have been have been so central to so many of the most important things and I can't wait to see the impact you're going to have on into the future. Great. Thanks very much, Mark. We'll talk to you again soon. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Cheers.